and I apologize for not speaking in French. I'm one of those awful English people that spent five years at school learning French and didn't remember any of it. Um, so I, I studied bumblebees, and I'm going to talk to start with about bumblebees. Um, I've spent about 20 years studying them, and uh, only relatively recently been looking at the impacts of pesticides on, on bumblebees. Um, but first, just let me tell you a little bit about them. Um, you hear a lot about bees, and people often talk about bees as if there's just one species. Uh, if you ask them to draw it, many members of the public would draw something with, that's round and fat with yellow and black stripes, and they're getting rather confused. Um, they think that, uh, that that thing is a honeybee, and of course it isn't. Um, in Europe, we have one species of honeybee, and uh, they're very important. I don't want to get into a fight with honeybee keepers about whether their bees are better than mine. Um, but there are lots of other bees, and they're also really important. So I work on the bumblebees. We have about 60 species in Europe. Um, but there are also thousands of other species of bee that are often forgotten and ignored. But they all pollinate crops and wildflowers and so on. Uh, so, for example, with the bumblebees, almost every tomato you've eaten since 1988, uh, I could explain why if I had time, uh, was almost certainly pollinated by a bumblebee. Uh, also things like raspberries, strawberries, runner beans and so on are largely pollinated by bumblebees rather than honeybees. So we need to look after both our wild bees and our domestic managed honeybees. So a big focus of my research is on declines of bumblebees. Um, sadly, bumblebees, uh, are, their distributions are very well documented in the United Kingdom and, and reasonably well throughout Europe. Um, and there have been uh, a number of declines. In fact, three species have gone extinct in Britain um, and another 13 species in individual European countries, four throughout the whole of Europe. <coughs> Um, so, um, if I could just show you one example of that uh, from the UK, I couldn't find similar data for France, I'm afraid, but I know that there are some French species which have declined similarly. Um, this is a, uh, a, a very pretty bumblebee called Bombus distinguendus, the great yellow bumblebee, its common English name. Um, and that shows you its distribution in Britain in the first half of the 20th century, um, the second half, and today. Um, it's basically disappeared from about 95% of its British range. And that's just one species. I could show you perhaps a dozen others that have undergone large range contractions in that kind of way. Um, why have they declined? Uh, we've already heard something about this. I think the, the drivers of bumblebee declines are very similar to the drivers of honeybee declines. Um, there are at least three. And uh, it's easy to get hung up on looking for a single cause. And I want to stress throughout this talk that, that there is no single cause. Um, and we won't get to the heart of this if we think there is. Um, so for a start, we know pretty much for certain that bees have been declining for at least 60 years because of the broad changes that we've made to the countryside, intensification of farming, which has resulted in there being far fewer flowers than there used to be. Uh, for example, in, I apologize, it's a terrible picture. Let me show you a better one. Uh, top right was a picture of uh, a type of habitat called a, a flower-rich grassland or a, a hay meadow, um, of which Britain used to have 7 million hectares um, uh, at the beginning of the 20th century, and we lost 98% of it by the end of the 20th century. So, uh, and most of that was turned from in, into cereal fields or arable fields, uh, or into silage fields. We switched from using hay as a fodder for, for winter animals uh, to silage, and hay fields were full of flowers, silage isn't. So there are far fewer flowers than there used to be. There are also um, issues to, relating to parasites. If you're a beekeeper, you'll be all too familiar with the varroa mite, but that's not the only non-native parasite that we've introduced to Europe accidentally when we've moved bees around. And I could give you a whole different talk on the global impacts of the spread of bee diseases. Um, but I won't, we'll leave that for today. Pesticides uh, are probably the issue that you're most interested in. Um, and they, for me, are the third driver of bee declines. Let me just, before I start talking about neonicotinoids specifically, show you a very complicated and crowded slide. It's complicated and crowded for a reason, uh, which is because I had to squeeze so many pesticides on it. Um, we have a, a project uh, going at the University of Sussex, where I'm based, 
where um, we're looking at the impacts of pesticides on bumblebees. And the first thing we did was we got the local farmers to tell us all the pesticides they used on each arable field on their farm. And this shows you the sequence of pesticides and, well, agrochemicals, I should say, um, applied to a single field. Um, this is a field of oilseed rape uh, in one year from when the crop was sown until it was harvested. So it was sown, uh, the dates are on the left, they're probably too small to see, but it was sown in August 2012 and harvested in June 2013. Uh, and chronologically, those are all the pesticides applied. Uh, there are two fertilizers and 20 different compounds of pesticides. So we have insecticides of, of five different types. Um, we have fungicides, herbicides, and molluscicides, um, all being applied to one field, and that's a perfectly typical field. Uh, I don't have similar figures for France, but I suspect that it would be very similar. And I find this astounding, that we are applying so many chemicals to every field in the landscape. From a bee's perspective, the ones that matter are the ones I've highlighted. So the ones in yellow are insecticides, and this crop um, was treated with the seed dressing of a neonicotinoid, thiamethoxam. Um, uh, so that's the first thing you can see at the top, if you can read it. Uh, but then later on, it's, it's treated in the autumn with a spray of pyrethroid insecticides, and then again early in the spring with another pyrethroid, and then later in the spring uh, with three more pyrethroids. And this is fairly typical farm management in England. Um, the ones in blue are fungicides. They belong to a class of fungicides called called a demethylation inhibiting fungicides. I apologize to the translators at this point. Um, and uh, we know that those fungicides have a synergistic effect with both pyrethroids and neonicotinoids. So the fungicide itself isn't at all toxic to bees, but if the bee is exposed to the fungicide at the same time as the insecticide, the insecticide can be up to a thousand times more toxic because the fungicide is knocking out the ability of the bee to detoxify the insecticide. So if you're a bee and you visit this field, which is a flowering field of oilseed rape, then you're exposed to a cocktail of chemicals uh, which act synergistically and are likely to be doing you harm. So now let me focus in on neonicotinoids. Um, this particular group of uh, neurotoxic insecticides um, that have been the cause of such concern in recent years. Um, Again, I'm showing you UK data, but I think you'd see fairly similar figures for France. Um, those are the five main neonicotinoids used in Britain, and it, that shows you the hectares that we treat with them. So the most recent data I have for 2010, clothianidin was the most widely used of the five. Um, the first three are almost exclusively used as seed dressings, and you can see uh, that square top right, that's, those are blue seeds of oilseed rape that have been coated with a neonicotinoid. Um, the other two are, are usually used as sprays on horticultural crops like soft fruits and vegetables and so on. Um, and of course you can buy these uh, chemicals for garden use, certainly still in Britain, they're widely available. Anyone with no training at all can go and buy a bottle of Ultimate Bug Killer and spray it onto the uh, flowers in their garden. There are flowers on the packet, just to remind you of where you might use them. Um, and with a certain sense of humor, I note that uh, Bayer, Bayer, the German company that manufactures Ultimate Bug Killer last year in Britain, was selling the chemical with free seeds for bees, which has a certain irony, I think. So use of these chemicals has increased greatly over time. They were uh, developed in the 1980s and became available in the early 90s. And you can see how successful they were. Um, they've increased almost year on year. Uh, and again, my data only go up to 2011, but the, we're in Britain applying about 80,000 kilos in total uh, per year to the landscape. That doesn't include domestic garden use for which there are no figures. So we're applying quite a lot and we've, we're applying more and more each year. Um, does it matter? Well, they are very toxic to bees, so toxicity is normally measured as an LD50. That's the dose that kills half, 50% of your bees in a test. Um, 
So just for comparison, I've put the LD50 up for um, imidacloprid, one of these neonicotinoids, um, and a couple of other widely used or formerly widely used insecticides. Cypermethrin is a pyrethroid, which is still available and widely used. And DDT is a famous chemical which has largely been banned. Uh, but you can see, for example, that um, DDT is actually about 6,000 times less toxic to bees uh, than uh, neonicotinoids are. To put it another way, um, if, if it takes four nanograms to kill a bee, and it's quite hard to visualize four nanograms, that's four billionths of a gram, that means that one gram, which is a small pile, the kind of um, amount you'd get in a, a sachet of salt on your dinner table, um, would be enough to kill uh, 250, or to deliver a, the LD50 to 250 million honeybees and we apply 80,000 kilograms to Britain alone. Um, that, that causes me some concern. But the key question is how much are bees exposed to? Um, it may be that they don't consume enough to do them harm. Um, so how might they be exposed? Well, this, this shows you the main routes by which bees might be exposed. Um, if they feed on a flowering crop that has been treated with a seed dressing, then they will be exposed to some neonicotinoids in the pollen and nectar. These are systemic compounds, so they spread through the plant, to the, through the roots, the leaves, to the pollen and nectar in the flower. Um, if they feed on horticultural crops, uh, they will very likely have been sprayed with thiocloprid or one of the other neonicotinoids. Um, there is evidence, and I'll talk more about this briefly later, that if they feed on field margin flowers, these are also likely to be contaminated uh, with pesticide. And if they visit gardens, then again, they may well be exposed. How much will they be exposed to is a key question. Um, there have been various studies which have quantified the concentrations, uh, which are usually measured in parts per billion, which is why these are all, these are all in parts per billion, PPB. Um, uh, so, for example, if a bee feeds on an oilseed rape crop, um, the nectar typically has maybe one part per billion of neonicotinoid in it if it was treat, uh, given the seed dressing, and six or seven parts per billion in the pollen. There's usually more in the pollen than in the nectar. Uh, you get higher levels if they're sprayed onto horticultural crops. The big question which is disputed is, are those levels of exposure enough to actually do harm to bee colonies uh, in the real world? Um, I, I got drawn into this debate about four years ago. I was running a, a charity called the Bumblebee Conservation Trust in the UK, um, and we got a lot of people demanding that we took action, that we campaigned against neonicotinoids. And initially, I was a little skeptical that the, they were really... This, we also had people... Uh, emailing us and telling us that we should be campaigning against mobile phones because they were the things that were causing bees to die and so on. So to start with, I was skeptical. Um, but eventually I read what I could find in the way of research uh, and found a number of studies that were published um, between about 1998 and 2011. Um, and most of them seem to agree that the concentrations found in uh, a flowering treated crop like oilseed rape were probably not enough to kill bees, at least not quickly. The bees don't drop dead after visiting a field of oilseed rape. If they did, we wouldn't be having this debate. The chemicals would have been banned years ago. Um, but it seems that there was evidence that it impaired the behavior, that it reduced the ability of the bees to navigate and to learn. Um, and that's really important. Bees are very, very clever insects. They need to be able to navigate. Um, to find food and bring it back to the nest. If they can't do that, the colony will dwindle. But the regulatory tests are all done on bees in a lab where they don't have to navigate. Um, and so it seemed to me and many other people that we might be missing the big picture, that, that the eff effects, if they're behavioral effects, sublethal effects, would only be detectable if you did experiments in the field with free-flying bees and may well have been overlooked entirely by the regulatory process. So we set out to do a simple experiment, and I won't go into detail of this, but it was the first experiment we did on the impacts of bumblebees, uh, uh, of, of bumblebees, the impacts of neonicotinoids on bumblebees. So very simply, we got bumblebee nests, 
and we wanted to simulate what would happen if they were near a field of oilseed rape that had been treated with a seed dressing. Um, so we had some control nests that we gave untreated healthy food to, and we had nests that we gave pollen and nectar, which we had added neonicotinoid to, uh, to mimic the concentrations which we know are found in the pollen and nectar of oilseed rape. We also had a third treatment where we gave them twice as much. Uh, and then we put the nests outside and we let them look after themselves. They had to gather their own food after the exposure phase. Um, and so they were free-flying bees from then on. And we monitored what happened to the nests. This graph shows you that the nests that were treated with pesticides grew uh, more slowly and reached a lower final weight. So the, the top line are the control nests. This shows you the, the y-axis is the weight of the nests over time, uh, the x-axis. So there was a significant reduction in weight in the treated nests, but most dramatically we found that the queen production, which in bumblebees is vital because only the queens survive the winter, the queen production was 85% lower in nests that were exposed to even the low treatment um, of the pesticide. Now since then, there have been a lot of other studies on bumblebees, and they pretty much all agree um, there hasn't been one good study on bumblebees which hasn't found a significant negative effect of these pesticides. And there have been studies in all sorts of scenarios, different ways of feeding the bees, free-flying bees, lab bees, and so on. Um, they all agree. There's, I've snuck in one honeybee study there as well. And if anyone, anyone's interested, I can send you any of these. Uh, uh, there's only one that hasn't yet been published, and I hope that will be very soon. For bumblebees, I think there's a really clear uh, and compelling case that realistic exposure, um, the sorts of levels of exposure that bumblebee nests will ex receive if they're living in farmland are enough to do major harm to the development of the colonies and to how many queens they produce. I would also concede, though, that the data for honeybees are more muddy, but I would point out to you that most of the studies that have found no negative effects of these pesticides on honeybees are studies that were funded by or were entirely performed by the agrochemical industry. And I'll leave you to draw your own conclusions about that. So just to finish this section, although I've put a lot of stress on these pesticides, I started by saying that there is not one single cause of bee declines. And I just want to reiterate that before I move on to some broader issues. Um, Bees are stressed by multiple factors in the environment. A lack of food uh, and a lack of diversity of food um, by various diseases and parasites. Um, and by they're exposed to multiple pesticides, a whole cocktail of pesticides which have synergistic interactions. Uh, I've already talked about the fungicide interacting with different insecticides. There was a really neat recent study from Italy on honeybees um, which showed that very low doses of neonicotinoids impair the immune system of honeybees and allow viruses to replicate much more rapidly, the same viruses that are spread by varroa. So the varroa and the viruses and the neonicotinoids are all working together to kill your bees. So it's, it's wrong to look for a single cause. And if your bees die and seem to have died from a viral infection, that doesn't actually mean that that was the ultimate cause of their death. Okay. So far, I've just talked about bees, but I now want to broaden it out a little and look at uh, the wider impacts of these pesticides, because I think this focus on bees has rather missed the very much bigger picture. In Europe, we have really good evidence that most wildlife that lives in farmland is declining, um, much of it quite rapidly. We don't have good data for, for all regions and for all groups of animals, but where we do, they seem to mostly be declining. So we have good data for butterflies, for birds, fairly good data for bees. We have good data for moths and some beetle families, and all of them are overwhelmingly declining. Now, I don't want to blame all of that on neonicotinoids, but I do think there's a very good case to be made that some of it is due to neonicotinoids. Why do I say that? Well, let's just look at this use of them as a seed dressing. So this little diagram is meant to explain uh, the environmental fate of neonicotinoids when they're used as a seed dressing. The seed goes into the ground with a coating. During the, 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 the drilling process when the seeds are sown, a small amount of dust is created which blows around in the wind. And that's highly toxic uh, 
um, to anything that it encounters, and it will settle on vegetation, on hedges and trees and so on, or on the soil. But that's only a small amount of the active ingredient. The remarkable thing is that these, this seed dressing approach was billed as giving really good targeting of the crop. It was billed as getting the pesticide into the crop and nowhere else. But the data suggests that actually only about 2% of the active ingredient goes into the plant that it's meant to go into, that is taken up by the roots of the crop. Something like 96, 97% of the active ingredient is lost into the soil. Now, in the soil, they are worryingly persistent. There have been lots of studies of the half-life, the time it takes for half of one of these chemicals to dissipate. Um, and typically, it's between 200 and 500 days in soil. Um, some studies have found it to exceed 1,000 days in soil, which would lead one to expect that if we use them every year, they will accumulate over time. And in fact, if we look at... Uh, these data, which are from uh, Bayer's own study performed in England in the early 1990s, this shows you what happens if you sow a barley crop treated with a seed dressing for six years in a row. These are concentrations in the soil the day before the next sowing, um, so a year after the chemical was used. Um, and I think you'll agree with me that over time there's a four different, uh, two different sites, two different application rates, but they all show the same thing. There's more on the right of those graphs than on the left. You don't need to be a, uh, an expert in statistics to see that, although if you do analyze the data formally, there is a statistically significant increase over time. So it's odd that when these data were submitted to the European regulators in 2006, the regulators concluded, and that's a direct quote, the compound has no potential for accumulation in soil. Um, I have to say that that can only be incompetence or corruption on the part of the person who wrote that. Okay, so they build up in soil over time, or they certainly can do. Um, they also are very water-soluble, and we know that they leach into waterways. Uh, we don't have data on the concentrations in, in aquatic systems in water for most countries. Um, I can't find really any data for the United Kingdom, for example. But where people have looked, in the Netherlands and in Canada and in California, they have often found... Um, significant concentrations, concentrations which uh, often exceed the lethal dose for aquatic insect larvae, such as mayflies, um, ephemeroptera is the Latin name, if that helps. Um, so we might well expect an impact on aquatic invertebrates, which would have knock-on effects for things like fish. We also know that if they get it, the, the whole mode of action of these compounds is they're drawn up from soil water by the roots of the crop, but they can also, of course, be drawn up by any other plant that happens to be growing uh, with its roots in the same soil. Uh, and we know that once they're into plants, they, they're also quite persistent, particularly in long-lived woody plants. So, for example, it's quite common practice in America to inject trees, uh, ornamental trees, with neonicotinoids to protect them against insect pests. And that injection can last for four years. Uh, essentially, you're making your tree uh, toxic for a long period of time. Um, and in fact, uh, you won't be able to see what that is down the bottom. But there was a, an interesting and rather uh, disturbing in, uh, incident in Oregon uh, last year where um, there were some lime trees, Latin named Tilia, um, very familiar European tree, um, which were uh, sprayed with a neonicotinoid to control aphids. The reason they were sprayed was because the aphids were producing drops of sticky honeydew and the trees were in a car park, so the poor people doing their shopping in the local shop were getting sticky drops of honeydew on their cars. So they sprayed the trees with insecticide and the next day they found 50,000 dead bumblebees on the gravel underneath the trees. And the reason that tree looks a bit odd is because they've had to net them in and they will have to keep those trees covered in netting for the next four years to stop bees killing themselves. Okay, so that's a picture of a, of a nice bit of a British landscape, but I could find a similar picture from France. We know the crop is, conta is obviously contains neonicotinoids. It's meant to, um, at least until next year. Um, this year, the oilseed rape in Britain was all treated uh, with the neonicotinoids because they were sown just before the ban. Um, so in a British landscape this year, the crop would have all been full of neonicotinoids. Um, 
The soil will have been accumulating neonicotinoids over time. The ditches and streams, the water in them will have neonicotinoids in it. And those hedgerows and those trees growing in the farmland, I bet you anything, will have neonicotinoids in. And I can say that with some certainty because recently we've started screening them. And yes, indeed, they do have neonicotinoids in them. So, for example, hawthorn trees, uh, Latin name Crotagus monogyna, um, the pollen of hawthorn, uh, which flowers before the oilseed rape, um, is full of neonicotinoids. So if you're a honeybee feeding in that landscape, you're exposed pretty much whatever flower you feed on. Um, I find that pretty worrying. Um, I'm coming towards the end now. Um, I just wanted to wrap up by saying that, of course, insecticides are bad for insects. Um, farming is bad for insects. Um, but we need food. And we need to weigh up the benefits of a particular way of farming, the benefits of particular pesticides, against the amount of harm they do. Now, that's a difficult thing to do. But it's extremely difficult when you can't find any evidence that the pesticides in question actually work. And that was, for me, one of the most remarkable things, is when you look for the evidence as to how much crop yields are improved by use of neonicotinoid insecticides, you can't find any. Um, in fact, until recently, there seem, seemed to be none at all, but in the last couple of years, there have been studies done in North America. They were recently summarized in a, a review produced by the Center for Food Safety in Washington. They found 19 studies, all from North America, where people had compared the yield of crops grown with or without that seed dressing, and in most cases, they found no difference in yield whatsoever, and in no case did they find that the farmer was better off using the seed dressing than not using it. So why on earth are we using these on virtually every field in the world when the evidence that they, don't, that they work is almost entirely missing? Um, in fact, why generally is farming not based on evidence? That long list of chemicals that are applied to every field does not seem to be supported by good evidence that we need to use them all. Uh, and any, it's anyone's guess which of them you could miss out um, without impacting on your yield. Why are we using so many? I would say very simply it's because most of the advice that farmers get comes from agronomists who are employed by agrochemical companies. And we need to move away from that very quickly if we're going to come up with any way of ma managing the land sustainably. There is a way forwards. Uh, we've known about it for at least 40 years. It's called integrated pest management, a philosophy of minimizing pesticide use. But when farmers are advised by people that sell pesticides, they will never minimize pesticide use. And on that note, I will just get in a gratuitous plug for my book, if you want to know more about bumblebees. It's available in, it's soon in German and Dutch, but sadly not in French. I do apologize. Um, thank you very much for listening. <laughs>